So we're going to start at the physiology. Uh, and I mean, it comes down to like your body is designed to eat uh, at the center of it all. I mean, your brain is ultimately what's controlling your hunger and your fullness. Um, when you look at the hypothalamus, it is a region that acts largely as a command center for hunger, satiety, energy balance. And it is constantly working to improve efficiencies. But what it wants to do, what your body wants to do versus what you want to do um, are not always the same thing. And there are key nuclei within your hypothalamus that are constantly sensing hormone levels in the blood and then signaling, sending different signals uh, to either stop or to start eating. Now, the major hormones that we need to understand, and this isn't going to be a science lesson, let me keep it pretty plain speak, ghrelin, leptin, insulin. Um, there are other ones that also affect hunger and fullness, but we're going to focus on these today. So when you look at ghrelin, um, which by the way, guys, I have a whole video on hunger signaling to begin with. This is not just a regurgitation of that. This is going to be condensed, but I also want to dig into the behavioral and the food patterns and like really what I see to be the bigger issues when it comes to overeating. Um, anyways, ghrelin, it is released by the stomach. It is that main hunger hormone. So the difference is hunger and then fullness. Now, ghrelin levels rise before meals and it they drop after you eat. Uh, now, this signals to your brain to start or to stop seeking food. Now, it doesn't mean that your actions are going to follow suit. And this is oftentimes what happens when people overeat their appetite, uh, outeat what their appetite actually is. Now, hormone number two, leptin, this is produced in and by fat cells, um, and it is going to signal fullness. So satiation, now, when fat stores are high, leptin rises and tells your brain to eat less. So, like, intrinsically, you do have a system that is encouraging you to not be overweight. Uh, when you lose fat, leptin falls and you get hungrier. So on the flip side, if you are starving yourself, if you're under eating, there is a system in place that is going to fight you tooth and nail to keep you alive, to keep you healthy. Now, the third one is insulin. Now, this is released in response to eating carbs. Now, insulin also signals fullness, but in people with insulin resistance, especially in individuals who are obese, the brain often ignores this signal. Now, you have different receptors that interact um, and, and really home uh, these hormones, and the sensitivity of these receptors varies. Uh, they can be influenced genetically. They can also be influenced by lifestyle factors and just repeated bashing of these receptors. Um, now, we also have short-term satiety signals. So when, you're, uh, when your stomach stretches, mechanical receptors signal fullness. Um, there's peptide YY, CCK, GLP from your intestines that say stop eating. So this is one of the pathways in which GLP-1s, they work on the GLP-1 pathway, uh, work to delay gastric emptying to suppress appetite. Now, why do these signals fail? Um, you can become resistant uh, even with high body fat and lots of leptin, your brain acts as if you're starving. So you keep eating. Uh, emotionally, you can become very non-responsive, very disassociative to these signals. Um, you can, they can be blunt physically or you can ignore them. There's an act of it being conscious or unconscious there. Now, some people just have a higher baseline ghrelin. Some people do activities that encourage ghrelin to be higher. Some people are in an environment and they create an environment in some cases that encourage ghrelin to be higher um, and their ghrelin doesn't drop much even after eating. So they feel hungry more often. Now, hear me when I say this. Chronic stress, so increased cortisol, that raises cravings, especially for high fat, high sugar foods. Um, it can blunt some of that fullness um, that you feel. I mean, like when you think of anything that drives up cortisol, that cortisol is stress. I have a whole video on the stress hormone and how much do you need of it, how much is too much, uh, what influences it, and how chronically elevated states of cortisol will actually make it really difficult to lose fat and to build muscle and to just be healthy and happy. Um, but there's also this reward system that eating highly palatable food, delicious food, 
it triggers a dopamine release in the brain. And over time, if you repeatedly overeat, your brain becomes less sensitive to dopamine. You eat more to get the same pleasure. And this is a pattern identical to addiction. Um, now, highly processed foods are engineered to maximize this response, making them very irresistible. Um, there is a ton of funding from big companies that look into how to make something more craveable, um, more comforting, more addictive. And within this scope, I mean, like, yes, you also have genetics. We can't ignore that. Some people are born more sensitive to food, food cues, uh, less sensitive to fullness, more prone to storing fat, and dozens of genes can nudge behaviors of appetite a little bit. Um, and they do create a difference in how easily people overeat. Now, in plain speak, what do I mean by this? It's not always about willpower. There are people who are genetically predisposed to struggle more and have to exert more willpower than someone else. Uh, some people do feel hungrier. Some people get less full. Some people get more pleasure from food because of this wiring. And we can't stop here because when we eat uh, when we're not hungry, this is a huge problem that many, many clients I work with, they struggle with. And this enter the psychology aspect. So why does this happen? Why do people use food as a coping mechanism? Um, I mean, there's the emotional eating aspect of it, where stress, sadness, boredom, even happiness, food temporarily numbs or boosts our mood. And some of this is a learned behavior. Um, as kids, I think largely genetics aside, like your food behaviors and what you're shown are going to influence how you approach food, um, what you deem fullness as, what's appropriate feeding times, what's an appropriate amount. I can say like my dad, he did not, uh, he grew up very poor. And he would tell me stories even early on about how there were times where his mom didn't have uh, money to put food on the table. And like it was very scarce. And even when he moved um, after he got out of school, there were weeks where he was between checks and he could afford a loaf of bread. And that's what he had to get him through the week. And I understand it now being a little bit older is like when you have someone who comes from poverty and in a scarcity uh, state, there typically is an overcompensation. And that very much was the case uh, with me. I mean, like he loved me. He loves me. Uh, he's still alive. I don't know why I said it like that. Um, but growing up, he encouraged me to play sports. He encouraged me to be active, had a lot of energy. And it was very often he wanted to treat me and use food as a reward or even like encourage me to eat as much as he was eating. And I, I understand now like where it comes from. It for a long time, it like fucked with me because I, I didn't I thought I would feel embarrassed because I, I thought that was normal. And I thought feeling like stuffed, like I thought that was how you knew a meal was over. It was very disordered, very dysregulated. Um, and it took a lot of unwiring because that largely is what I was shown. 